name is Rosalinda Larios, and today I'll be presenting with two of my colleagues who I've closely been working with at Cal State LA over the last year and a half. I'm Gina Mitchell and Margaret Clark. Um, so with further ado, lights, camera, action. What happens to accessibility when a course goes live? Oops. So to create a course that is inclusive and stimulating requires an instructor to be cognizant of the diverse learning needs of our students. In today's rapidly changing society, it's more important than ever that we take into account the impact that the content and activities could potentially have on our students' social and emotional intelligence. Our objectives for this morning's session are to examine and discuss the types of activities assignments that are inclusive as well as accessible for students in an online course. Lastly, to problem solve dilemma that emerge in our online class. So how do you truly know that every aspect of your course is accessible to all of your students? Student learning needs are not homogeneous. Researchers have suggested that student that student to student, faculty to student, and even faculty to institution interactions could sometimes lead to a sense of isolation or even an absence of community. That coupled with diversity within student demographics leads to an even greater need to create opportunities for student engagement throughout the instructional design and course delivery. Universal Design for Learning is a framework that embraces both flexibility and creativity while maintaining the rigor and addressing our module learning outcomes. UDL emerged in the 1990s as a framework to support diverse learners. However, over time, it has become a leading framework on online learning. UDL guidelines of development of flexible learning environments and learning spaces that can accommodate individual learning differences. According to Katie Novak, a researcher with a lot of UDL background, um, says, that UDL does not mean creating a challenging curriculum and then modifying later. It's designing your lessons or modules so they're accessible and challenging to all students. While Novak did not include cultural responsiveness, I'd like to add it. It's designing your lessons and modules so they're accessible, culturally responsive, and challenging to all students. Cultural responsive modules should connect with students on a personal level, lead them to understand the content in relation to important social cultural factors and increase their capacity to challenge the dominant narrative. In 2010, Dave Eddie Byrne recommended kind of a Goldilocks approach. As instructors and course designers, we should provide students with an opportunity to try multiple options to determine which one is just right. So that way we ensure the performance is acceptable to meet the high standards. The following three slides I'll briefly review the three guiding principles of UDL, engagement, representation, and actions and engagement. So engagement, the why of learning. The goal of engagement is to be able to support self-regulation. Engagement has been defined as a complex construct that consists of behavioral, cognitive, and emotional components. As course designers and instructors, we promote engagement by developing work that encourages interest and relevance to students, we foster persistence and offer levels of challenge as well as support. Representation, the second principle, is the what of learning. It involves creating opportunities for students to have meaningful access to the content and to be able to comprehend the content we present throughout the course. To do this, we need to consider what students will see will create, verbalize, and or write, and even hear. So action and expression. It's the third strategy, the how. Through strategic planning and executing steps in various learning tasks, we are offering students various ways to improve executive function. Using a variety of modalities, we give students the opportunity to demonstrate what they know. So as we planned for the course to be fully online, we participated in two workshops, a Quality Matters course, and with a few webinars in between, CETL, 
our Center for Effective Teaching and Learning at Cal State LA offered us an array of resources and guidance. Ultimately, Canvas, the school-wide learning management system, was what we used. Um, it has many features available within it. However, we explored and integrated platforms such as Nearpod. Nearpod allowed us to embed a variety of activities into one lesson. Additionally, we were able to record ourselves, embed videos, and website links. So through websites, we were able to connect students to organizations locally, nationally, and even internationally. Through YouTube, we were also able to present relevant video clips, such as TED Talks. A new platform, well, at least to us at the time, that we were excited to explore was Flipgrid. Flipgrid provided a way for students to post short videos themselves or even their observations in the community. It gave students a space to video replay to one another and receive video feedback from the instructor. instructor. The last platform we explored and integrated into our course was Google Drive. This tool allowed students to collaborate using Slides, Doc, and Keep. All of those platforms allowed students to actively engage with the content, their classmates, as well as us as the instructors. As I'm going through the slides, I'm noticing that there was one platform that I did not include, and that is Zoom. Zoom was introduced um, as a way for our students to have small group discussions and check-ins with instructors. It's the platform that we're using today, and it really is something that we've all come to use frequently. So now one commonality that Margie, Gina, and I all share is that we have a special ed background. So if we can advance, Margie. That said, students' diverse abilities in relation to learning are always on our minds. Um, but keeping in mind the commonality has been helpful because accessible design is a federally mandated under the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. A few key features that need to be considered are that all text is available in logical order, complete navigation is provided, tables and headers and captions are there, images are described, page numbers are included. Um, with that, I will be passing it over to Margie and Gina, who will share the evolution of the course, as well as the responsibility of accessibility that we uncovered throughout the first iterations of our course. Hi, I'm Margaret Clark uh, from Cal State LA, and I'm a full-time faculty member in the Division of Special Education and Counseling, and I'm the author of the course, so I, I go all the way back to its, its very beginnings and, and I'm very invested in the course. So this was, this was quite an interesting process for me because I'll take you through the history of the course in, in just a minute, but to uh, travel with this course over a couple of iterations has been very, very interesting to do. Um, what you're looking at right now is you're looking at the main page of the current course, EDSP 3010, as it's, it's known now. And our course is called Individuals with Disabilities in Contemporary Society. The course is an exploration of disability on the world stage. Uh, at the time that uh, I did this transformation of the course, Cal State LA did not have any general education courses that related to disability at all. So I saw an opportunity to create a course that could go from being a very small course to a course that students all over the university could take. Shortly thereafter then, we met the process of converting it to an online course. And, and so I'll take you through that history in the next slide. But what's interesting about the course is it's not, a, not quite a traditional academic course, I, I often say. It's more of an extended conversation about disability. We in American society don't talk much about disability and we tend to stay in a don't look, don't talk, feel sorry mode far too often. And so we're dealing with students, many of whom are first in their families to go to college and who have a strong Latino base. And so we, we will see some cultural factors that come into play as we 
teach the course. So what we wanted was we wanted in converting this course to online to maintain that conversation about disability. So that presented us with a, a particular challenge as we went along. So let me, whoops, I hit my clicky too soon. Let me see if we can click over here and I'll show you. You saw this is the, the main page for the course as, as I showed you. And we organized the course. We're on the Canvas platform and you can see all my grading I have to do. Um, we organized the course into modules. And each week we have a, a you know, pretty similar structure. We begin with an agenda that allows students to see what it is they're going to do. So this is from a recent week that we just worked on. And this is one where we actually take the students through definitions of some basic terms in terms of disability. One of the things we worked really hard on was organizing the agenda so students could follow it. And it involved a lot of feedback from students. Um, I had an interesting learning process. Last semester was the first time we did it fully online. And uh, one of the things that was interesting about design I learned is they needed vocabulary. So this is a direct outgrowth of what students wanted. But we have a list of tasks, everything is linked two and three times, and then a checklist that they can use. And this is their organizer. So here's what I have to do, let me check off, did I do it? And then reminders from the instructor at the bottom. And then what I've done in organizing this is done, put, built in some duplication. So here's module content and concluding the module that organizes what students are doing a little bit again, but then all of what's on the linked on the agenda is also lined up here. So there's two ways for students to find what they need. And we find that that works really, really well. Uh, one of the more important components of the course is let's build in a little bit of uh, redundancy. So let me, I'm in, I'm in full, so I have to change my screen here. Just give me a moment. We're all sort of fumbling learning how to do this for the first time. Um, so let me take you through the history of the course then so you get a sense of what it was. ESP 301 was the original number of the course. Cal State LA converted from the quarter system to the semester system in September of 2016. So anything with three digits is a quarter length course. Anything with four digits is a semester length course. So ESP 301 was originally written in the late 90s as part of a, a new program that we were offering for undergraduates who wanted a baccalaureate degree in um, teaching, but with particular emphasis on teaching in the urban environment. Cal State LA is located in East Los Angeles, and it's about as urban a, a, a university as you're ever gonna find. And um, so what we wanted is we really wanted to train our teachers to teach in the school district that surrounded us, Los Angeles Unified School District, but also to teach in the neighborhoods that surrounded us which are dominantly either Latinx, Asian American, or African American. So EDSP 301 was written for the special education credential majors. And it was designed again to be just a very simple course. It was a three quarter unit course about disability. When we began to prepare to convert to the semester system then, the decision was made not only to convert it to a semester course, but then to expand its offering. We had had a lot of feedback from the students doing the elementary education option that they wished that they could take the course to. And so I saw the opportunity to make this conversion to general education. So it, to have it fulfill a social science requirement and to have it fulfill our diversity requirement as long as, as well as to, to fill a requirement in what's called civic, civic learning. So a course that really looks at civic engagement. So with all of that, then EDSP 3010 was born. We expanded it from a course that really fo focused on domestic court, uh, disability to international disability and converted it from a three quarter unit to a three semester unit course. So we increased its, its content by about a quarter. Uh, shortly thereafter, Cal State LA started an initiative to develop hybrid courses that would allow us to uh, offer courses online one day and, and in person one day. And I was encouraged by my then department chair to do 3010 that way. 
And so it was originally offered as a hybrid course. So I would teach it usually on Monday or Tuesday, and then the students would be off offline or online working Wednesday or Thursday. And it afforded us a really interesting opportunity to um, say to them, look, let's talk about some things, and then I'm going to send you out in the world to look at them. And, you know, we can talk about disability just so much. And then eventually you have to say to, to students, now go look at it. You need to see what the world is doing to people with disabilities and how people with disabilities interact with the world. So uh, it was organized into a series of, of modules and each module included what I called field work activity, where they had to go do anything from go walk around a mall and look at how disability is managed in department stores and, and other facilities to interviewing a person with a disability to uh, checking on how do I travel if I'm a person with a disability and to go you know, do a series of activities with an airline. So it was a very varied, it's a, it's a varied collection of activities. So we got it underway that way and offered it hybrid for two years and then came along the opportunity to convert it to fully online. And I was a little reluctant to do this because I didn't want to lose the in-person -per conversation. So that was the big, to me, the big challenge to doing this. But, but Jean and Rosalinda joined in and we went to work on converting the course. So fall semester of, 2000, of uh, 2019 was the first time that we offered it fully online. And it, it's been an adventure and we've, we've learned a lot over the last couple of, uh, the last couple of semesters doing this. Um, but it's, it's really starting to take shape and our students have been invaluable in directing us and letting us know where we need to go. So currently then what we have is we have a course that is a four semester unit course. It's an upper division course in general education. So we have students from all over the university taking it. Currently we offer it entirely online and all of our sections are online. It's asynchronous and they do one module per week. So you could see the, the week four module that I showed you was the one they would have done obviously the fourth week of the semester. Um, we do four to six offerings a semester, and then we have one during the summer that runs over six weeks, and one intercession that runs over three weeks, and those are hardy souls that take that one, and who teach it. Um, we have 100% enrollment in all of our sections, so it's in demand, and we're getting wonderful feedback from students about it. Uh, we were talking, I was showing it to my colleagues the other day in a faculty meeting, and two or three of them chimed up, oh yeah, the students really like this course, and I was very happy to hear that. It tends to be favored particularly by human services majors, and so I've listed some of these like public health and child development. We have four teacher preparation majors, and we see those students a lot. And it's interesting, we're getting, it's spreading a little bit. We're seeing things like criminal justice now in communication studies. So um, we've run into a few challenges as we've gone along in, in making the conversion. Um, first of all, as I've, I've mentioned, I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit here, is the, the challenges of offering it only online um, and let loss of the ability to, to have those face-to-face -face interactions and how do we, um, how do we maintain or, or, or substitute those? And, and we make use of a lot of use of discussion, but we're still sort of exploring, are there other ways that we can do that? Uh, second, we learned very quickly is too many applications. We got a bit too enthusiastic when we first planned and uh, it was offered in the summer kind of as a trial balloon before we really went fully went live. And first thing we heard was too many apps. So we had to, to prune back. And then, you know, we're still arguing about the benefits of, of the online versus hybrid models. And should we be doing it entirely on, online or should we offer the two? Um, there are some student issues that we're beginning to, to grapple with. We've really discovered the, the challenges of designing for students who aren't necessarily trained to be online learners. Um, second of all is having, uh, making sure that they have reason, reasonable expectations for what an online class is gonna be, and, and especially the time expectations. Many of them think that the, the time that would have been, been in-person time just washes out and don't realize that they have to put that into online time. Um, we're, we're groping with enrollment uh, after the first week of the semester. 
what do we do? And we ended up uh, restricting enrollment after the first week to uh, buy instructor permission this semester, and that really helped. And most importantly, we'll talk about this a little bit later, how do we keep students on pace, get, keep them going and, and moving through the course content? Biggest thing that we, we grappled with all the way through was accessibility. So I'm gonna hand this off to my colleague, Gina, now, who's gonna to talk to us about accessibility. Thank you, Margie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gina Mitchell. I'm a part-time professor in the Charter College of Education at Cal State LA and a teacher of the visually impaired. Um, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about accessibility. When we had a face-to-face -face course model, the instructors were able to wait until a student self-identified as having a disability and work with the individual student to meet their specific needs. But in online courses, this is no longer practical. An online course cannot be quickly redesigned at the start of the term to accommodate accessibility needs of the students. So the goal is to design the course with accessibility in mind at its inception. This ensures equal access and will also eliminate delay in instruction for your students with disabilities. Let me change the slide. Thank you. Uh, so there's some general concerns during course design that we want to address. When designing an online course, you may encounter challenges with ensuring accessibility. A few of the most encountered accessibility challenges are outlined here. We struggled with a few of these ourselves when we designed our course. When selecting a learning management system, a university may choose a variety of external tools to embed in the LMS. If the instructor wants to use alternate external tool, tool that has good accessibility, the LMS may not support it. And we found that ourselves when we were designing our course. This limits the range of the tools the instructor can choose from and it possibly binds the instructor to the tools that are not fully accessible. Another challenge is the inconsistency of the accessibility of the LMS and external tools themselves. For example, some platforms have good accessibility features for accommodating learning disabilities. However, they may lack accessibility for visual impairments. There's no one size fits all platform that will accommodate the needs of all students. What we find is that this puts the burden on the instructor to find workarounds to ensure the course is fully accessible for all. Among others, this may include creating alternate assignments, changing submission requirements, or modifying discussion formats. There are additional challenges when an instructor is using videos to supplement their instruction. Videos that contain highly visual content, such as graphs and maps, are not accessible for students with visual impairments. However, there is not a comprehensive library of described instructional media that's appropriate for college courses. Sending a video for professional description services is costly for the university and possibly for the instructor themselves. And there are comprehensive guidelines that must be followed when you're using a do-it-yourself description service, and that makes the task time-consuming and challenging for instructors. An additional challenge with instructional videos is that many are not closed captioned for the deaf or hard of hearing, and many of the captioned videos have been auto captioned and not checked by human eyes. And this leads to many grammatical spelling and content errors. Finally, good course materials are often shared between instructors or even posted in open forums on the internet. And while this is great, uh, many times along the way that material has been scanned into a PDF. This creates an image of the text that cannot be recognized by screen reading software. There's methods to convert this into recognizable te uh, text, but most instructors skip this step because it takes time and requires proofreading. So finding readable PDFs or of instructional materials is also one of the challenging tasks. So in our, force, in our first, uh, while we were developing the course, we submitted it for an accessibility review. And despite our best efforts, a few accessibility issues needed to be addressed. Uh, first, we had developed those uh, in, I'm sorry, interactive presentations that Rosalinda mentioned, and they were on the platform called Nearpod. However, Nearpod was found to be largely inaccessible by our students with visual impairments. They also found that some of the videos we used were um, incomplete or had inaccurate captioning and the videos we had created ourselves had no captioning at all. 
we felt that we had done a pretty good job of meeting accessibility needs. However, these were issues that we needed to address before launching our course. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so after receiving the feedback, we found ways to address the accessibility concerns that had been raised to us. We solved our Nearpod concern by creating an outline of the presentation on a Word document, and we allowed those students using it to email submissions to the questions that we had originally embedded into the Nearpod. So they did not need to use the Nearpod directly themselves. For videos that we had made ourselves, such as our welcome messages or our syllabus overview, we made use of the built-in LMS features to both record and caption our messages. Our other captioning issues were resolved by, by searching for alternate video or print pieces that met the same learning objectives and presented students with the same content. We also had the opportunity to submit a few videos to the captioning service that the university contracts with. While this is a solution for videos that are integral to instruction, these services are extremely expensive for the university and can also take weeks to complete. By making these small changes, we were able to ensure that the course met accessibility needs. Next slide, thank you. Uh, so to ensure your course is meeting universal design of learning protocols, there are a few general suggestions that we can apply to a variety of educational needs. We found that by giving students access to the course LMS at least one week in advance of the term start, it gives the students with disabilities time to review the format of the course and discuss their areas of concerns or needs with us. This allowed us enough time to address their needs prior to the course beginning, which meant for a lot less scrambling at the last minute for us. We have also added a written submission option into our assignments that were originally vision, uh, video submissions. This allowed students that did not want to disclose their disabilities or had their anxiety triggered by video submissions to complete the assignment in a more accommodating way. Likewise, we've also added a video submission offer for several of our written assignments. This allows students whose disabilities create difficulties with writing to complete the assignments in a way that's more accommodating to them. We've also found that many students that do not wish to make their disability known prefer to leave their camera off during synchronized lessons or group video chats. Allowing this option has received good feedback from the students in the course. Many students with learning and other disabilities need support during synchronous instruction. We've received feedback that these students appreciate receiving a recording of the lecture to review at their own pace after the session has ended. We have also found that being flexible with due dates and timelines reduces anxiety and frustration for the students with disabilities. Many of them are working with specialized technology or adapted equipment that can slow down the production of their assignment responses. Another suggestion is to allow students to propose an alternate assignment that might be more accessible to them. Students with disabilities are experts on their own accessibility needs. Work together to create an alternate assignment that meets the learning objectives while taking their personal needs and experiences into consideration. A final consideration is instructional time. For many students with disabilities, sitting at a computer for long periods of time is challenging. They may not be able to maintain attention for long periods of synchronous instruction. This may not be conducive for students with a physical or mobility impairments as well. When using a synchronous module, be sure to give instruction in short segments with frequent breaks. Next slide. As you design the course, there are some disability specific needs to consider. And while we don't have time today to cover them all, I'd like to offer just a few suggestions for disabilities that we have seen self-identify most frequently in our courses. For deaf of hard of hearing, we've already mentioned to ensure that the videos you use are captioned. Some university support centers might even help you research alternative material that is accessible for you. Make sure that if you are um, having any synchronous meetings, that you check your video platform to ensure split screen capability. That way you can ensure both you and the interpreter can remain visible to your students. Another alternative to that is loaning a tablet to your students so they can stream the interpreter on one device and the course on the other. 
Uh, if you're creating a recording or streaming synchronous um, meetings, consider your lighting and your clothing. We want to make sure that you have bright yet diffused lighting that will eliminate shadows so the student can easily read your lips and see your facial expressions. And you should wear solid dark clothing with minimal jewelry. And also a big consideration is background noise during instruction and recording. Background noise can be distracting and disruptive and it makes it challenging for students to hear the instruction. Background noise includes student in the course, so always make sure that microphones remain muted uh, when it is not an open discussion. For our students with visual impairments, it important, it's important that print materials are made accessible. There are students that may be using screen reading software and they need headed, headings and formatting on PowerPoints and Word documents. It allows them to easily um, navigate and search the documents with their software. If they're not using a screen reader, they may prefer to have their content in Braille. In these cases, print materials should be submitted to the department that oversees your students with disabilities so they can be described into Braille files. Those are known as BRFs and can be sent to the, the students electronically so that they can be read on their electronic Braille devices. So be prepared for this possibility as well. Another option is to save your PowerPoints as rich text format, which is also known as RTF, and that quickly converts your PowerPoint into an outline, and that helps the students with visual impairments navigate that presentation a little bit easier. We also want to remember to reduce and even eliminate decorative images on your presentation. Uh, for some students, these are visual clutter and can make it hard for them to distinguish between content and what is just there as flare or decorative imaging. Um, and as Rosalinda mentioned, always make sure you have alt text on your images that is descriptive and succinct. We also included a description of the LMS format and how to navigate it in our syllabus so that our students with visual impairments could quickly navigate the Canvas site. For students with mobility impairments, they may benefit from having a classmate that um, is assigned as a note taker if you're having any synchronous meetings. These students may also need to use a platform and tools that support speech to text trans transcription. So make sure, make sure that your LMS and the tools you're using can support that. What we have experienced is that some students have had anxiety or PTSD triggered by live interaction with classmates or even the instructor. So consider allowing these students to work independently on group assignments. Another extension, uh, uh, suggestion is to allow them to forego group video discussions and create another um, alternate assignment for them. And finally, many, if not all of the strategies I mentioned today will benefit students with learning disabilities. That's the great thing about universal design for learning. It will ensure access across disability groups. And I have one final thought to leave you with on this topic. Accessibility does not only apply to disabilities. Consider financial implications of the course design. Not all students have access to a smartphone and therefore not be able to record assignments that are taking place outside of their home or away from their computers. Some students do not have computers with, with a camera or an external speakers. I've, uh, we've addressed this by providing a list of the free on-campus resources that are available to help students complete these tasks. Um, that have these tools available to them free of charge. Again, universal design ensures access for all of our students. So one of the things that, that we're confronting right now is, is dealing with dilemmas involving our students. So we wanted to take a little bit of time with the group now and open the, the presentation up for questions so that um, we could look at, at some thoughts that you might have about how we can deal with this. Um, we sort of, what we're going to do is each, I want each one of us to, to present a little bit of this and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions. But um, how do, the, the biggest problem with an online class I mentioned earlier was the issue that students are not necessarily good online learners, that they expect online classes to be shorter, they expect them to be easier, and they don't realize that there's a specific skill set that they need to have. Um, one of the biggest 
pieces of feedback that, that I got from my students at the end of the sem first semester, and it really stuck with me, was the idea that they needed more encouragement. And so one of the challenges that we were confronting in this, this need to keep our connections with students was uh, at what point in the course do students need encouragement, what kind of encouragement do they need, and, and what are the best approaches to giving them encouragement? Gina? So we received student feedback that they are struggling to feel connected both to us and to each other. And so we've been playing around with some strategies and tools that we can use to increase the student connection. And um, we want to open it up for suggestions for you and we'll relay some suggestions as well. Unmute, Rosalinda, yeah, you're muted. I just unmuted myself. Um, okay. Thank you, Marky. So, you know, it's not that all students are minimally participating because overwhelmingly students have enjoyed the course. However, we every offering of the course, there are those few students within each section who are minimally participating, barely getting by um, in the course or even disappear for long periods of time. Uh, so, you know, they're limited and complete participation in discussions erratic assignment completion, uh, don't necessarily attend chats, advisement activities, or even seek advisement, um, don't respond to emails. Um, so we'd like to know how would, how do you prevent or reduce um, what we're calling ghosting? Um, and if that hasn't come up, you know, what strategies do you um, have in place to prevent that from happening? So I'm going to take this out of full screen now so that we can see the, the chat area and we'd love to have love to have your questions at this point. Okay. Cecilia, are we? Yeah, you still have about 10 minutes left. Okay, I'm not seeing. And I, yeah, they have access to the chat and if they want to put it in there or they can use the question and answer tool and okay. the question in there. I don't see any yet in the question and answer, but they can use either of those tools. There it's now, I'm just trying to get it down. I'm scooting things all over my screen here. Okay, so, so Laura shared that announcements are a great way to engage students. Um, definitely at least one a week. Right. Um, that's kind of, I kind of sometimes struggle with um, get overwhelming students with too many announcements and inundating because then they stop reading messages is what I've heard from students. I don't know if anyone else has had something similar. I, I do what I call friendly Friday, Friday reminders. So they sort of know to look for stuff on Friday for me and then that that tends to help a little bit. And uh, so I find that that at least reduces the volume a little bit. And uh, of course, the, again, the ones that we really wish would read it, it's like the, the parents you want to come from, to parent conferences never do. The one that you wish would really read them oftentimes don't. Yes. Um, I did see a comment about discussion boards. We do make use of discussion boards in this course. At the end of our first um, semester piloting the course, we had a um, survey for the students to complete. And I also, um, we've made, we've created temperature checks, what we call temperature checks, kind of a check-in mid-semester with the students. The feedback that we received from both of those is that students actually appreciate um, having video submissions. They feel more connected to their colleagues and their peers when those discussions are taking place with video, seeing them, hearing them, and being able to respond via video. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a comment here that the course landing page, page is announcements, so they can see it when they come to class. Canvas allows us to put announcements at the top of the page, of the, the landing page, so we tend to use that, but that would be interesting to try using just the announcements page. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I like that Susie suggested um, that something she's found helpful is to have the one-on-one um, -on -one or group real-time introductions in the first week to create connection. 
And I know we've done something similar. Um, you know, if either of you would like to elaborate, but where students um, do little introductory videos to one another and they respond and um, we start with one ourselves. Um, and then we have an intro, like an orientation optional advisement session as well at the beginning of the course. Yeah. So we have two questions in the Q&A area. So Sandy Johnson asked, what tool do you recommend to caption videos outside of the LMS? You want to take that? Jim? Well, the best tool is actually to submit it professionally because that will ensure that it's accurate and, and grammatically, punctuation, and so forth. There are some uh, do it yourself tools. There is um, auto captioning on YouTube. If you do a video on YouTube, it will auto caption it for you. But again, um, it's, it's not necessarily accurate and you cannot proofread it and change it when you do it on YouTube. So there's no great option um, that is 100% other than having it professionally done. And, and just to, to jump in on that, because I see a question about captioning live se sessions, um, we also have access to Camtasia and Camtasia has captioning capabilities. So we can, we can add captions. We ha and we can come in with a pre-written script and, and upload. So that's, that can be really helpful. I, I got permission to use several clips from a program from CNN that I had to caption myself and was able to do it in Camtasia reasonably, uh, reasonably easily. And uh, so that works pretty well. I see Microsoft, somebody talking about Microsoft Stream. Uh, we have the Microsoft package. We might have to take a look at that one. Generates closed captions. So that might be interesting. Um, I like Marianne, you mentioned yeah. a motivational Monday um, and setting, scheduling your announcements. And I like that. I know that's become very popular, even in person classes, um, just kind of sets the tone for more collaborative community environment. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Make sure we got everything. Um, yeah, somebody commented if you write a Laura comments if you write a script to prepare for a video you can use that as a transcript mm -hmm. and that's that's true that's helpful so we get to that's a helpful tip um, you do Tara said you do weekly quizzes to make sure students are understanding the content um, we can embed quizzes into Nearpod and, and I often will do those as check for checks for understanding um, I'm working with two first semester adjuncts on the course right now. So um, Gina's teaching it right now, Rosalinda isn't, and um, then I'm working with these two. So we're all kind of developing things together and I'm wanting to encourage them to engage in the course and invest in the course. And so we've had a lot of fun with playing with the capabilities of uh, Nearpod and what we can do with Nearpod, but we're still struggling with accessibility in Nearpod. Um, Mary Ann said there's a tool called Mo Movie Captioner. Gina, are you familiar with that? Yeah, I have heard of it. Um, I haven't used it myself. And I think um, my resistance is just coming from a special education background that I want to make sure I'm using um, videos that are already professionally captioned. So I'm a little more resistant to doing my own captioning. And for this course, particularly, we were discouraged from doing that by the um, university department that oversees our accessibility. So um, I know that there's a lot of ones, good ones out there. Um, so I'm not discouraging you from using them. I just am a little resistant myself. Yeah. Yeah. We also saw, is it Pan, Panopto and PlayPosit is are mentioned. Mm -hmm. Are you either of you familiar with those? No. No, I haven't. That's be worth looking into. Um, that's terrific. Yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone for sharing. We've got about five minutes. So, Rosalinda, you want to sum up? Yeah. So, just concluding, um, UDL allows for activities and assignments to be inclusive and accessible to all students. Um, a change to the course once it's up and running should not have to impact the course design. And students' needs vary as well as accessibility extends beyond ability. So I know Gina brought up that sometimes um, 
there are other factors that inhibit students from accessing content and we need to be mindful of that as we design courses. So um, I don't know if we have any last questions or thoughts um, that you'd like to share with us. We have our emails there at the bottom um, of that last slide. So if you'd like to get in touch with any of us, um, we'd be happy to hear from you. So thank you all for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, it was really, it was really fun. Quite an adventure to do this. Yes. So any last questions? Oh, here's one. Oh, you're you. welcome. You're welcome, Wendy. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I want to thank Margaret, Rosalinda, and Gina for doing their presentation today. Um, I know that you know this is difficult for all of us right now, and to do this in Zoom, I really appreciate you guys doing this, and I appreciate all of you for attending today. And we're gonna, um, I wanna make sure that you complete the survey. I put the link in the chat. And now we're gonna go to our break and we'll be back at 11.20. Okay, take care everyone. Thank you everyone, enjoy the rest of the conference. So Margaret, if you want to stop your share. That's what just fixing to do. There we go. So many, so many things to, to keep track of. I'm sorry I lost the screen at one point. I clicked the, um, my, or uh, moved the uh, cursor. I was trying to adjust something and I hit a, a thing from Raw Story. <laughs> I forgot to turn my- Oh, you were off. fine. You were fine. <laughs> Really, it went very smoothly. I'm pleased. Yeah, thank you.